for my assigned seat. You know, what's the kid going to do? So I said, let go of my hand. I let go of me. And so uh, he, he went back. He grabbed me, and he went back, and he went and hit me as hard as he could, and I ducked. And he broke all the bones in his hand. And he went home and came back to school a couple of days later with this cast saying, I'm going to get you. I ran. I ran. He never got me, thank goodness. But, uh, yeah, I was, I, and then I got through. You beat him up. No, no, I didn't beat him up. I ducked. <laughs> So, so you can, there can be behavioral things that cause uh, hurt. Um, so uh, under a variety of suffering, it's physical pain, uh, behavioral incidents that can cause it, um, relational pain, we talked about that, betrayal, domination. Instead of caring for one another, they can dominate selfish people and families. And uh, um, also a, a, after that, uh, expectations can cause an awful lot of uh, sufferings. I thought you'd be home on time and uh, all kinds of things. Um, Rejection and abandonment are life experiences for a lot of people uh, growing up when you get them into their adulthood. And I'm convinced childhood wounds do not get fixed in childhood. Childhood wounds have to go through to the point of maturity. Not till they're 18, not till they're 21. And now we have, I, I, I plead guilty to, I was a boyish man into my 30s. I didn't understand authentic manhood. And so... Uh, I've, there was rejection and abandonment and other things that were going on. Um, betrayal, we've talked about. There can be emotional suffering. There can be physiological suffering, and it's very, very real. And the one that to save for last is spiritual suffering. There are people that use and abuse spirituality. And uh, um, when you really feel like the Lord has abandoned you and become desperate and hopeless, um, read through Psalms. Some of the psalmists, they, they experience anguish because of that kind of experience, spiritual suffering, where they felt, uh, I'm all alone, there's nobody else. No, 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 I got 10,000, didn't bend the knee yet, so hang in there. Um, but, uh, you know, people really are suffering, and it's a very real experience for them, and uh, I never, ever, ever, ever say, just get over it. I heard that too many times. Uh, I grew up hearing, uh, stop your crying before I give you something to cry about. So uh, I smile a lot. I don't know if it's from those wounds, but uh, I smile a whole bunch. And because uh, if you're smiling with tears down your cheeks, you don't get beat as bad as if you're not smiling, tears down, running down your cheeks. So I learn to smile. So, but God's gracious. He's good. Some of us are. So that's a little bit about variety of suffering. We're going to move over to the next page. I hope to do, if I can find it. I'm trying to keep it. So thank you for correcting me. So that kind of, I hope that fills in all the gaps from the previous page. Now we're going to talk about will suffering be remembered? What do you think about that? Is it going to be remembered? Uh, I'll read it off my page. I, I, underneath, above that, it says sinfulness needs salvation. We're all born in sin. I'm sure you know that. It needs salvation. And that salvation process, I am convinced, includes suffering, which then leads to sanctification. Um, uh, the, the Lord haunted me with that process. It's like, and we say, oh, yeah, well, we, we need to process that. Well, you know, I know how to bake a cake. I, I put it in the oven, watch the heat, and then it does stuff. When we're processing wounds, what does that mean? And so I, I recognize that I'm sinful, full of sinfulness, and uh, that puts me in a place of need, a remedy for that, and there's only one remedy for that, and that's the salvation work of Jesus Christ as designed by the Father. And in that process, it included suffering for Jesus, and it, the journey includes suffering for us. Uh, I, ha I have a sister who uh, has no needs. She, she's, she's a professional, great income, um, and she's uh, uh, got, you know, got family, and she doesn't need a thing. She doesn't need a Savior. Yoga is her God. And so she doesn't need anything. And she ain't getting any younger. She's just a couple years younger than me. And I'm really worried because Jesus came to seek those that are lost, to seek and to save those who are lost. My sister's convinced she's found. I'm really getting nervous. So I've even asked, Lord, if suffering would help her come to you, I'll be a good brother if I can. But salvation... You know, sinfulness brings to salvation, which includes suffering, which then leads to sanctification, which is kind of the process that we're called to be sanctified by God. So now, uh, verse 6 says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, even though now, present tense today, 2018, I think that's the year, it might even be in uh, October, somewhere around like the 19th or something like that, um, 
even though now, because I think Scripture is timeless, for a little while, I don't know how long, I don't know what little means in this text, but for a little while, if it's necessary, I'm convinced it's necessary. It's an if clause, but I'm convinced if it's necessary, you have been distressed, stressed uh, by various trials. That's suffering by well, my five T's. Do you remember them? Trials, tribulations, testing, temptation, and trouble. That, that's going to be your life. I'm warning you now. It, it's inevitable. To different degrees, I hope, I hope not real bad, but trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and trouble. So when someone says, oh, a calamity happened, yeah, no surprise, right? I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was going to be a hurricane or tornado, but uh, I wasn't sure what it was. But I didn't know if it was going to be an earthquake, volcano. I, I, I didn't know, but it's coming. So when it gets here, I'm not blown away. I never thought that would happen. I didn't know this would happen, but I knew trouble would happen. So when trouble comes, I'm getting older. You know, I, I, last time doctor said, uh, sorry, bad news. What's bad news? You're going to live another year. Come back then. All right, I'll come back in a year. See if I'm still going to live another year. I'm healthy at the moment. I, I don't think. My dad had Alzheimer's. If I repeat the same message again this hour that I did last hour, <laughs> let me know, okay? Uh, I'm going to get it. My mom had cancer. That was ugly. Something's going to happen. I don't have eternity in this life, I have eternity in the next. I'm looking forward to it. So even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, even though tested by fire, the proof of your faith may be found to result in praise and honor and glory. What do you think of that? So uh, in Lamentations chapter 3, uh, there's a verse that I translate into my, uh, after Jeremiah, because he, he lamented a bunch. Hey, if you ever want to learn about suffering, after you get done with Psalms, go to Jeremiah and Lamentations. That's, that's a real trip. Um, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 31 through 33, says something like, For the Lord will not reject forever. It, here's, here's the Lord distancing himself I'm not going to reject forever for if he causes grief that means he lets grief sadness pain suffering come into your life then he will have compassion that's kind of like we did a little before but here is in the Old Testament lamentations but he will have compassion according to his abundant that's big how big is God's abundance you ever think of how big big is the God you know I ask people all the time how big is your God I wonder how big big is to God. When, what does he think is big? You know, because he's, he's enormous. He's, he's infinite. I wonder, God, what's big to you? Well, here it says, according to his abundant loving kindness, for he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. He doesn't really want us to hurt, but he knows that hurt is, is part of the journey. And I'm convinced if you wait long enough, and because we're long-suffering, uh, if we learn how to wait a long time, eventually at some point, in God's timing, not my timing, I don't even know if it's going to be this life or the next life, but at some point, God's going to say, uh, you know, I'm going to use all that. God doesn't waste any pain. So I don't volunteer for pain, but when and if, however, it's okay. And somehow, when I expect trials, tribulations, tests, and temptations, and troubles from a long-suffering God then all of a sudden it becomes manageable because I know there's an end to it. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, there's an end to it. An abundant God is going to take care of us so that at the end of the day, which is God's day, you know, a thousand years or something, I don't know, what I, my watch doesn't work that way. Um, so at the end of the day, it's going to be okay. Now, it's funny, you know, I always have that, someone told me this about Job, and I don't know if it's really true, but uh, Job blessed, got blessed back again. He got everything back. He's got his home back. He got his crops back. He got, he got his animals back. He got, he got everything back. And God even gave him back kids. Now, somebody said to me, that was God's getting even with, with his wife again. She had 10 more births to go through. So, you know, is that fair? I don't know. It's like, I don't know. I don't understand. I'll never will. I'm definitely male. Um, when uh, I don't understand women after they go through the pain of labor and they say, Oh, kids are the best. Let's have another. It's like, that's like, whew. 
uh, and yet there's no doubt to explain. That, to me, that's a, a God phenomenon, that you, after bringing this miracle thing, this life into existence, then you're willing to go through pain and suffering. To me, it's all, it, I know it's way different, but if I could make a, a kind of a goofy parallel, when I go into pain and suffering, I know there's a day of joy that's coming, because God says, rejoice in the Lord always. So there's a day of joy coming. It's inevitable. I'm going to get there. And uh, my tough times just seem to fade with time. I can be brought back to the intensity of the pain of the event. I can have a flashback. I can get triggered back to original pain. But the healing journey, we'll look at how do you know you're getting healed when you go get brought back to that. God doesn't waste any pain. But what he does for you and for me when we get triggered, when we see someone that's had a loss or a betrayal or an abandonment or a death or so whatever it is, that, that huge pain, trauma, loss that happens. I can go back to when my dad passed, and I can go back to when my mom passed, and I can remember what helped me. And more than anything else, agape love is caring for another person. To spend time in the ministry of presence, to just sit there and say, your pain matters to me. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. You're absolutely right, but you matter. And just not being alone in that agony can be so healing. How do you know you're getting better with that person? How do you, people want to know, you know, I, is the pain ever going to stop? Well, it will, but I don't want it to stop when they go home to be with the Lord. I want it to stop sooner rather than later. So how do you, how do you measure growth? We'll talk about this again. But interesting thing, uh, not in your notes, just free thought. I don't think I put it anywhere, so I think God wants me to share it with you. How do you know if you're getting better or if you're getting worse? Three, three measuring sticks. I think it works. So tell me if you find a fourth or something different. Healing is taking place when the experience of pain is not as frequent as it was at the beginning. Kind of like you find out your husband dies and you're in turmoil 24-7. You can't sleep, you can't eat. It's all day long. It never stops. And then eventually you find a way to get a little bit of rest because you go nuts. Sleep deprivation is really serious make people crazy. So at the end, it, it's, not on, it's not all the time. It's just periodically. It's like uh, a woman who was very close to her mom, never married. So her and her mom were best friends. Her mom passed away about two years ago. She doesn't cry every day anymore. It's less frequent. She cried every day for a long time. At the beginning, she cried all day. But it's less frequent. Now when she has an emotional breakdown, when she's trying to minister, she's great at church. She's really a good servant. Surrender to God, really asking God for blessing. And so now when she suffers and she has a breakdown, it doesn't take hours to stop crying. The duration is different. So it's not as frequent. It doesn't last as long. And I always use the scale 1 to 10. How bad's the pain today? How bad are you missing mom on a scale 1 to 10? Give me a number. It was always uh, 15 or 20. I said on a scale 1 to 10. Yeah, but I'm 15 or 20. Okay, okay, it's 15 or 20. But now it's like uh, it hasn't been up to 10 in like literally probably a couple of years now. Mom's been gone, I think, about four. So it's about halfway through now. She says, uh, it's about six or seven. I just have lonely times. So it's how frequent, how long does it last on a scale one to 10, the intensity, how intense is it? Now, when you see someone now, let's say something happens and she's struggling. If she starts grieving more frequently... And she grieves for longer periods of time, and it's more intense, so more work has to be done. But if it's less frequent, less duration of sadness, pain, turmoil, and a less intensity, you know they're getting better or worse. And so uh, if you're looking at people say, well, you know, ah, it's six weeks later. When are they going to get over it? Well, maybe they're getting over it. it. They don't cry all day every day anymore. They cry every night when they try to fall asleep. But they can fall asleep within, within a half hour, an hour. And uh, she doesn't soak three pillows. She, she gets through one pillow. So that's growth. We get so impatient because we don't want to suffer with people. We don't want to paraclete. We don't want to, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 1, come alongside and, and support and care for them. Uh, because when you do that, you have that spiritual bonding, that intimacy, that connection takes place. And that's where heart-to-heart Christianity comes in. It's really neat. Uh, Up in our town, Benton, uh, uh, we had a flood. Nothing like, not as expansive as what was down in North Carolina or there in uh, um, 
Panhandle, wherever it was. Um, but um, uh, Samaritan Purse, Eight Days of Hope, several ministries came in and helped us with the cleanup. And they were there for three weeks, and they put out a call for volunteers. And I volunteered. I got the phone call. I said, what time do I get there? And we helped put in buckets of mud. And one thing about Eight Days of Hope, when they organized that, and they said, we're not coming here to scoop up mud. Anybody can scoop up mud. We're coming here to love them. So when you go to the homeowners who's just lost everything, and people did, they lost everything, and they weren't insured, and so they lost everything, everything, and they want to tell you their story, and they want to sob, you sit down and you cry with them. Don't worry about the mud. We'll take care of the mud later. You love these people. And uh, had the experience, have pictures on my, my phone of this woman who was a widower, a widow, and uh, she's aged, and she's in a wheelchair, her foot broke late, lately, and she's in a cast, and her basement was filled with mud. And so Eight Days of Hope went down and scooped up the mud and cleaned it all out. And uh, she, all she did was sob, I have nobody. This never would have gotten fixed. And what's happening typically is the mold comes in, the house gets condemned, she would have nothing, nothing. And so, but Eight Days of Hope came in, and we scooped up the mud and vacuumed it and put in the hum dehumidifiers and cared for her. And... Uh, I don't know, but people like that will go to church after a while when they have gratitude. And they'll listen to people like they've never listened before. And that they're, they're in, uh, down in North South Carolina right now, Eight Days of Hope. You've got to retire to be able to do that. I'm so jealous. I wish I could retire and just do it full time. But they travel the country and Samaritan's Purse and all those things. And, and uh, they don't take a dime. It's all volunteer work. Like, well, how much is this getting skimmed off the top? I know. I know. I, I met the director, and I had a chance. He needed some counseling done, and I, I offered to do that for them. And um, so uh, they don't get anything. They, they don't take anything. It's church-sponsored, and they're just, and they're saying, we, we can only do what we can do. So however many people, okay, you six people go to that house, and, you, and they are traumatized. They are suffering. They are people. They lost so much. And... Uh, our goal there is to care for them, to love them, to sit and talk to them. Anybody can scoop up the mud. Oh, my goodness. And every morning at breakfast, they have uh, a message and sing a hymn. And every lunch, they, they grab hands at the end of the work day and go have dinner. And then they have church every night. Every night they I mean, I'd go to church every night. I'm telling I'm so jealous. To me, it's almost like they're in heaven. Just celebrating every day, loving on loving people. I think that's what we're going to do in, in heaven. We're going to love, love people. It's going to be a good thing. So that's, uh, God doesn't waste any pain. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So that's your Lamentations passage of Scripture. So enjoy it. Um, now, as we read through, uh, we read through 6 and 7, I want to go back up to the uh, first S is security in uh, chapter 4. Uh, and uh, our first letter, A, will be reserved. It comes right out of verse 4. And let me flip back over to the passage of Scripture because I like the Bible sometimes. And... Uh, we're in e First Peter, there we go. Look at verse 4, First Peter. It says, I'll start in verse 3. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yay, God, you're awesome. Uh, who, according to his great mercy, how big is his mercy? Great. Oh, I like that word. And has caused us to be born again because of his mercy, holding back judgment upon us. He could have sent us to hell. He had mercy. He didn't send us to hell. He, instead, he born again did me. And to a living hope, wow, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, to inherit an, in, an inheritance that is to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. There's the word, reserved in heaven for you. Uh, I am so thankful. Steve uh, made reservations for me, so I have a place to sleep tonight. I'm very thankful. And tomorrow night, he did the whole thing. That was really good. Uh, I have a reservation. The reservation here is in heaven. God said, you do not have to worry about missing your, your, your appointment. It's reserved for you. Your reservation is yours because of the blood of Christ. It's, reserved. it's special for you. You don't have to worry about signing in late or signing out late, uh, signing in early. You don't have to worry about that. God's already got a place for you. It's reserved. It's, and uh, verse 5 says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. 
then after it's uh, letter B, it's protected through the power of God. How, God. how big is your God? How strong is he? How tough is he? You know, I love the, you know, being in the hand of Jesus, which is in the hand of God. It's kind of like double insurance. Like, like I could open up God's hand or Jesus' hand. They have one side or the other. Can't open up one. It's like, you know, it's so secure. That's why the denominations, and I hope no one takes offense, that don't teach eternal security, the power of God. Uh, in the beginning was God, God, uh, Jehovah God. How mighty is your God? It's totally secure, guaranteed, sealed, Ephesians 1, sealed, stamped until the day of redemption. I don't get that benefit today. I, but scriptures tell me I, I enjoy the knowledge of that benefit. It's, it's reserved in heaven. God's protected it. Big muscular God. Sorry, that's not very impressive, but, you know, big muscular God. God's big. You know, how big is your God? How powerful? You know, they, they don't understand creation. We're, and earth is so small in, in, our, in our solar system and our Milky Way. And, and that's a little, I, I don't get it. I just, I'm, my mind doesn't go that way. It's just, I don't understand infinity. How big is your God? I mean, he can carry it all. We don't need an atlas. We have Jehovah God. God is so big, and he is protecting that. Letter C is ready. Um, ready to be revealed in the last time. I love it. I love it. Protected by the power of God through faith, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, and I'm going to, my interpretation of Scripture may be a little bit off here. But, you know, Jesus said he's going to go and prepare a place for you. He said that thing. And, uh, you know, a mansion, whatever that means. I don't, I don't know, whatever's in heaven is going to be, like, so much better than earth. It really doesn't matter what it is. He's going to prepare a place. Here it tells me it's done. It's ready. We, don't have, we won't have to wait for a reservation. You can't get there early. You'll be there perfectly on time. You're going to be there, and it's going to, I don't know if it's going to have your name, but you're going to know it's yours since nobody else's. You're that special. You and yourself are that special and privileged that God knows every hair on your head. It's an easy count for me uh, and some of, some of you other gentlemen. But uh, um, he, he, he knows you. He knows what you won't share with anybody else. He knows every secret you have. All that shame that we get, all, all that guilt and inadequacy. We'll talk about that later in the weekend where, where you know, my dad told me I'm no good and I believed I'm no good. You know, my dad said it. He's dead. I'm not. He must know. So I'm no good. All that's gone. The stuff that, you know, a couple should be intimate and share their, their most vulnerable things. And I, I can't tell my husband that because he's a jerk. He'll say something stupid. Well, guys, we don't say stupid stuff, do we? Yes, we do. You know, I didn't mean to hurt you. You devastated me. Uh, I just heard recently from a, a, a daughter who's in counseling with her dad. And her, on her wedding day, her dad never told her she was beautiful. And he said, I didn't know I needed to. Dad, you have to tell your daughters they're beautiful on their wedding day. I don't think, it's like women, they just want to be beautiful. They want to be desirable. They want to be attractive. Hey, don't tell anybody, we're any kids here now. Women want to be sexy too. They want to be desirable and attracted. They do. I just don't know women that don't want to be desired by their husbands. And teenage girls want to be desired by everybody that isn't going to be their husband. Major tragedy. But women want to be desirable. They want to be sexy. They want to be adorable and, and, and treasured. We'll get to that. But uh, yeah, man. But in heaven, it's ready, ready. I absolutely believe it's ready for you. Waiting for you. Now, don't rush to get there tonight. No, 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 no quick exits, huh? We don't want to deal with that. But it's ready for you. And it's fully protected. It's reserved for you. Number two, look at the quality of it. In verse 4 and verse 7, uh, it says, uh, back in verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. Um, you can't destroy it. You can't damage it. You know, like a new car, don't mess with my new car, no new scratches or anything like that. You know, uh, it cannot rust. It will not deteriorate. You're, it's reserved. It's imperishable. It won't go away. It can't perish. It, it's protected completely by God. Imperishable, undefiled, you can't damage it. You know, husbands, we're supposed to, uh, and we'll talk about it, when we're, we're ministering to our wives, we're supposed to be God's sanctifying agents 
uh, for our wives, which is a really uh, assignment I haven't been able to figure out. I just know it's my job. And so um, uh, it's undefiled. It can't be spotted. It's like, you know, Scotch Guard, whatever that is, like it won't stain. Uh, that's our inheritance. It's not able to be damaged. It's totally screwed. It's spectacular. It's so unlike earth where everything here is decaying. You know, second law of thermodynamics. Everything's deteriorating. Everything's going to rust. Everything's going downhill. It just everything ages here. Not in heaven. Not in heaven. You are so special. He has something that cannot be defiled, cannot be made dirty. It will not fade away. You know, everything fades, you know, when you wear the same hat or shirt or whatever you do outside and then leave it out in the sun. Or uh, I have this uh, a per- perennial fight that my wife and I have is I like tools and every time I buy tools then she borrows them and uh, she took one of my uh, um, uh, hammers, the fiberglass handle hammers, which I don't I like. I like fiberglass ham- hammers and so I have one of them. Uh, we actually have four and I can tell which ones she borrowed because one side of them is pink instead of red because it was laying out through the winter under the snow. And, and so uh, I'm, we're not allowed to fight over tools. I just go buy another one. I'm, I'm done that. But it, it turns pink. I turn it over and say, oh, that was the one I got last year. Oh, yeah, it's the thing on the other side. Nothing fades in heaven. And you are <coughs> more precious than purified gold. How much gold you got? How much gold do you think God has? How much do you think he even cares about gold? Not a, not a bit. Not a bit. Not even the mortar or the streets. Right? He doesn't care about that. But I, I think it's like the best he could do. Like you are so more precious than anything else there is. What's the value? What kind of value does God place on you? How, how important are you? What would he pay for you? What would it cost to Buy your salvation, redemption. What, what's he willing to spend? Anything that's needed. Well, you got this debt. You got this spiritual debt. In Matthew 18, the king recounted, you owe 10,000 talents, King James, 100 pence. And so you, you owe all this money because of your sins. You owe, you owe, you owe. How's he going to pay off your debt? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I'll tell you what, I'll pay for you. You deserve to go to hell and stay there for eternity, but I'll make a deal with you. If you trust my son, I'll let the perfect one die on a cross for you so you don't have to suffer for all the sins you've committed. How many sins does it take to earn hell? What's that? One. That's it. Have you committed a sin? Uh huh. What do you deserve? Hell. What's it worth? 10,000 talents. I don't have 10,000 talents. Well, you deserve to go to jail. Nah. Big creator, God. In the beginning was God, God. I'll wipe it clean. I'll wipe it clean. You don't know anything. Wow. Now, you can be hurting, but if that doesn't do something, then you're not setting your affections on things above is my only conclusion. I don't know what else to do with it. Get past your selfishness and be grateful that I don't have to hurt forever. I get to receive from Jehovah God. When does this happen? When does it happen? At his appearing. At his appearing. Um, so, following my... Th- my letters, uh, number two, quality, it would be imperishable. B would be undefiled. C will be, will not fade away. And D is valued more precious than gold. When's that going to happen? At his appearing. So what's the result? At his appearing, what's going to happen? What makes it worthwhile at his appearing? I think that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. Back in the passage of Scripture, verse 6 says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed through various troubles. That, here's the reason, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, is, which is perishable, even though it be tested by fire, what's the reason? This may be found to result, here's the result, found to result in three things. 
praise, glory, and honor when at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there you go. What's the result? Praise. So what is, what is you know, praise the Lord. What's that mean to you? Praise the Lord. You know, I, I, when I hear that, I think about, <clears throat> am I taking the Lord's name in vain? Or am I really saying to you, praise the Lord? Am I saying to me, Let, let's praise God? Am I just using to say, that's awesome, praise the Lord? Or am I saying, well, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. Am I, am I meaning it? Because when, when we say that, when you get to heaven, you're going to receive praise for your ministry. You're going to, you're going to receive praise. That's, you get it for the work you do. Now my, I'm, Lord, I, I, I'm richly blessed this weekend because I get to do something. I think God's called, gifted me, challenged me to do for his glory. And I, and I do pray. This week I pray. And I, all the counselors at our counseling center are praying for me. I have prayed for me this week. I know some will remember to pray for me this weekend. And I'm so blessed in the Danville office out there, not too far from where you were, Pastor. Uh, I have a group of ladies that a couple of them have been to me for counseling to help reconcile. And reconciliation is taking place in their marriage. And they're so thankful and indebted that I know they call themselves the princess warriors. They're the child of the king. And they are praying for me. I know they're praying for me and for you this weekend. I have no doubt. And they're going to want to hear next week when I get back. So what happened? I said, you have to ask God. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to tell them what happened. You, I'll give me your number. They can call you. You can tell them what happened. Because if nothing happens this weekend, then it's not good. If, if we come here and, and we open up the word of God and we don't give God something to say, praise you for what you did with what you got. Because I'm trying to be biblical. I'm trying to use scripture. I want to give you this. And I don't think there's any scripture I refer to that you guys don't know about. I think you're in the word. You're going to be here on a Friday night. you got a pastor that teaches the word. I know you got to know it. But I'm hoping the Holy Spirit does something different where you can say, you know something? I'm not going to stay the same. I'm going to look at suffering. When I see suffering people, it's going to be different now. Something's got to change. Now, I do expect, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I do expect that when you get to glory, if you just receive from the Holy Spirit the word of God and do something, he's going to say, praise you. Praise you. That's it. That was discipleship. That's sharing the glory of God. That's expressing it. It's not keeping it to yourself. You know, we're not the Dead Sea. We don't just take water in. We want to be the Sea of the Galilee where there's lots of fishes. So we can go fishing. I like fishes. I don't want to be the Dead Sea. Nothing grows there. I don't want to just take it in. You know that. You've heard that before. Amazing. So I want the, the word praise has to do with an expressed positive recognition. I want to express, verbalize, type in my cell phone or email. I want to express positive recognition. That's what praise is. I wonder, he will recognize you and me. The Bible says we, he's, we're getting rewards up in heaven. And we, you know what you do with your rewards. We don't, we, don't keep, we don't need a reward in heaven. We take that and we give it to Jesus for what he did for us. We turn in our rewards. I, I don't need it. I don't need to take it home. I'm at home with him. And I can praise him. I can give recognition to him. And God the Father is saying, you deserve recognition too. So, so praise I love the word glory. I love Christmas time when you sing glory, glory, glory. You know, I, I won't sing it because I don't want you to leave yet. So glory, you know, all that glorious stuff. And so I love doing that. But the idea of glory is taking a spotlight and pointing it at something. And it's kind of like I, I got these goofy lights in my eyes. I don't really like it, but I'm not going to argue with it because I guess it helps TV or something. I don't know, the DVD they're doing, whatever that's for. But when, when that's happening, they're putting the spotlight. God's going to put a spotlight on you. He's going to give you honor and he's going to give you glory for the good that you and I have done. That's the purpose of this phrase. He's, he's going to give glory. Wow. Does that mean that creator God, God in the beginning God, does that mean that 
he's really noticing what I do and don't do. Like when we resist, we don't, we don't sin. We, no temptation is such as common. God will make a way to escape stuff. Does he notice? Yeah, he notices that. I'm confident. He's all-knowing. He knows that. And when you do something for his good, and it, hey, I, I saw you there. I saw you there. Down there, Annapolis or whatever you're doing. That, that, uh, yeah. Wow. And then honor. See his honor. To, to give a high recognition, uh, a, a, a respect, uh, uh, um, to esteem, to, to lift up, to, to give value. You know, when, the, when you value something a whole lot, it's like a treasure where, where your heart is, where your treasure is there, where your heart lie also. Where you put your investments. What are we here to learn how to do? Invest. Invest in what? The gospel. The gospel ministry. Which brings back up to, you know, sinfulness leads to salvation, which includes suffering, which can lead to sanctification. And I, I want that growing, sanctifying process. I, I want to, and I, I promise you, from the studying I've done since Pastor invited me into suffering, let, man, i got to look at Scripture. What's it saying? Well, what, what, God, what do you want me to bring here? Uh, Pastor Kevin, can, can you give me some hints? No, you're on your own. Like, okay. Me and Jesus do just fine. So, so we're doing this with full intent. Uh, and I like, you know, we're supposed to honor our wives. I'll, I'll talk about men tomorrow in the second session where it says, you know, we should, husbands, dwell with your wife in an understanding way, giving honor unto her. And somehow in my devotions, God said, I have to give honor unto my wife. How do you do that? How do I know if I'm getting the job done? And I'll plead guilty right now. My goal has not been accomplished in my ministry to my wife when it comes to giving her honor and recognition. Now, I do recognize, I say thank you a lot. I would say almost all the time. And she would, I, I say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right already. Okay, good. Uh, I'm getting the message across. But I want to, that's not the honor I want to give her. That's this appreciation. But to honor is to show worth and value. And the word that I come up with is the word treasure. I want, to, I want to treasure my girl. I, I want her to, here, here's where I, I, I make intentional efforts to do things that I would hope in my dumb way. I ask my daughters, what do you think, you know, mom? That way if my wife says, that was dumb. What, how did you think of that? It was your daughter. <laughs> you know, my, my one daughter's birthday is uh, one week before Christmas, Annette. And so Annette and I used to, I used to, I'd date my kids. And so I date Annette for, take her out to dinner for her birthday before Christmas. I said, come on, I'm taking out for you. It's your birthday. Now she's in her 30s and I love my grandchildren. But I say, hey, find, well, I'll find a babysitter for you. We're going to, I have, you know, if she has to find the babysitter, it's not a father-daughter date. I have to cover the bases. I found that out. My wife said, if I have to cook dinner and uh, find a babysitter, it's no date. Well, I learned that. that I'm not, for you husbands that are down there, you got kids at home. It's uh, dinner and babysitter or it's not a date. I get it. So I tell my daughter, come on, let's go out, let's go shopping, because I want to treasure your mom. I want to buy the right gift. They're the same size, so she tries it on, it's good. And so I, I used to do this, and so, and my wife caught on after a couple of years. It's not me, she, Annette thought you'd like it. You know, what, what do you want me to do? I'm a guy, I'm stupid. You know, what? So and now I still want to treasure her, and I, my goal is that she would feel like a treasure. Now, ladies, no elbows, and do not raise your hand. Does your husband, guys, I'm putting you on the hot seat. Don't worry about it. I'm a work in progress. Does your wife feel like she, that you treasure her? Does she feel like a treasure? So now tw- spin it around to the text. God is treasuring you. Whoa. I admit I'm not that good. But for a guy that grew up with an emasculated, uh, uh, I'm an emasculated man. I was a boyish man into my 30s, guilty as charged. In, my, in the, my, the 90s when Promise Keeper was a big thing, I went, wow, I'm not a manly man. I'm a boyish man. i got to learn how to be a manly man now. And so I went through that process. As best, and I'm still journeying. My wife said, you ain't quite there yet, but thank you, sweetheart. Keep me posted. So I'm trying to get there. And in the process of that, God says, I'm that valuable to him. God wants me to feel like a treasure. When my, my dad said, you're stupid, you're no good, you know, you'll never make it. God says different. God, I grew up believing lies. 
And some of you in here had the same stupid stuff that I went through. And we believe lies about ourselves. And I'm convinced God doesn't make any junk. And he treasures us. And if he wanted me to graduate high school at six foot instead of five, ten and a half, I would have graduated at six foot. But he said, Steve, you're fine just the way you are. You're my treasure. And I'm willing to pay whatever it costs. Steve, I'm willing to pay whatever it costs. I'm willing to pay with my own son. I'm willing to send my son to die for you. Boy, does that change me. Does that change me? I think there's a reason for suffering. Will it be remembered when we get there? God says, I will not forget. He can't forget. He knows all. He knows what's in his word. He knows what's there. And you will be praised, and you will be, the spotlight will be on you. He's, there's going to be glory, and there will be honor. You are a treasure of God, and he won't forget it. But my frustration is it's not today. I know it's going to be, but as far as I know, I'm not going to heaven today. So can I be patient? Can I be faithful? Embrace suffering, trials, tribulations, testing, temptations, and troubles. Can I, can I embrace that suffering? Paul says in 2 Corinthians, God will come alongside me and support me and comfort me and care for me. Not just for me, for you, so that you can be comforted as you go through your pain and suffering so that you can suffer some, help someone else through their pain and suffering. Father God, as we uh, take a pause here. Lord, it's suffering. I, I don't volunteer for it, but when it comes, I need to learn how to welcome it. Because you don't waste any pain. You don't. Matter of fact, you know our pain even when we're trying to numb it, medicate it, avoid it, stuff it, pretend it's not there. Lord, as we're going to learn, can we change? Can we grow as we look at tomorrow morning's message? Tonight, I would ask and, and, and plead with you, would you allow these, these brothers and sisters of mine, these kind folks, the, your, these lovely children of yours, would you allow them to experience your comfort? I know there's some that are hurting tonight. And, some, and we can think of others who are hurting around us, our neighbors, our friends, our family, our church friends. People are suffering, and Lord, I, I, without a doubt, I believe your word is teaching us to allow your comfort upon our lives so we might share it with them. For your glory, you paid the price. And Lord, as we think of the, the honor, the glory, the praise that's awaiting for us, let us be faithful out of hearts filled with gratitude. You're an amazing, awesome God, Lord. So we want to give you the honor and the glory. As you challenge us to serve you, I pray this would be a precious time where genuine change takes place and we can glorify our Savior, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you. The Father sent you. We thank the Father. We thank the Son. And treasure the Holy Spirit that dwells within that we may appreciate all the many blessings to our wonderful God, Creator God, and our Savior, His Son, we ask your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen.